Okay, good evening. How are you doing? You okay? Greek salad was yummy. Been on like this Mediterranean kick ever since our Israel tour. Speaking of that, wasn't that great if you attended that? That was so fun. And I'm so glad you got to meet my friend Ronnie. Um, he, he's a fun guy. He was a wealth of knowledge. Sometimes it is a little hard to understand. He has a thick accent. So sometimes it is hard to understand him. Um, but it is a lot of information. He's got a lot of information. Now, if you are interested, are we live? Yes, I think we've got it. Yes, two thumbs up. Okay, so Becky Heiss, you say you watch every Wednesday night and you do it from home. So I'm saying hello to you. <laughs> Somebody, somebody keep her accountable. Check to see if she was actually watching. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had a lot of interest in the, um, the Israel tour, uh, the virtual tour, and, and a in-person tour. And I was talking, you know, there's all these, these challenges with the, going to Israel right now, of course, with um, the things happening in the world. And, but it looks as though things are slowly opening back up and they're going to be rebuilding the industry. And so what I had them do is pencil us in for November of 2023. And so by then, we should have a good path uh, forward with no restrictions. And so that's what we're looking for. If you're interested to know about that tour, and you want to be in the loop. Doesn't mean you're committing, but you just want to be in the loop and you want to know about it. I'm going to have you um, subscribe your email. And on the app, it is under, you click on the app, you go to the home page, and under connect, right there, you'll see Israel trip. You click on that, you can register. I registered myself and my wife. And then what's that going to do is that's going to compile an email for me. And then any information that I'm going to get, I'm just going to just trickle it out to you every time I get a word. And, you know, normally these things, you kind of want a year to plan them out. Um, just the, the nature of the cost and the commitment that it takes. And so we're a year and a half. And so I'm just going to trickle some information out there. If you're interested in that, I'll keep you in the loop. And um, so just go on there and get the email. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to go, but you have the information on what it looks like. Any questions about that? Um, Kelly, you actually took your kids. How old were your kids uh, when you went that one time? You were 16? I would say 12. Yeah. 1215. <laughs> so did Brandon, and he was 30 something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I on it. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, you, you'd want it 13, 14, 15 be minimum, I think. Um, what? I don't think you want to bring your nine. I mean, you could, but I don't think you want to. Just ask. <laughs> Just pack them on. Put a little pack and play or whatever you get the little deal. And... Yeah. Yeah, under two, it's free on the airplane. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the be it'll be the beginning of November. Right. <laughs> Sounds like Finn's going to Israel. All right. <laughs> Okay, any other questions on that particular thing, item? Sweet. Uh, other things to note, events coming up. We have a few events coming up. There is uh, this weekend, if you are 18 to 32 apparently, you can go. <laughs> You can go to the College and Career Retreat over at Youth Dynamic Ranch uh, with my brother-in-law, Shane Land, and uh, they're setting up camp over there. They're going to be at Stonewater Ranch, kind of a blast, so check that out. I highly encourage you. Retreats are just the best to get away. And, um, and then coming up 
on February 12th. It's a Saturday. We're having Taproot Theater here. Real excited about this. And they are going to put on an improv comedy, kind of like a whose line is it anyway style, with a Valentine's theme. It's going to be hilarious. So they'll do, they'll do uh, audience participation kind of thing. They put on a real good show. And what we're encouraging you, you know, anybody can come to this thing. We would encourage get a babysitter, make a date out of it. We're just going to provide the, it's going to be like a one hour kind of thing. Go out to dinner before or go out to dessert afterwards and, um, you know, make a date out of it. Have fun and uh, look for that. And, that. and that'll be a free event. It's a lot of fun. February 12th, Saturday, February 12th. And then for high schoolers, you parents with high schoolers, their winter blast retreat is coming up President's Day weekend. And then they're looking ahead in March to see kind of this is way reaching out. But March 19th, they're going to be uh, the ladies are going to have the if gathering here and it's uh, what's nice is they're doing it the week after it's live so they can kind of edit it out and get it down to the, the good teachings um, for that day so anyways stuff coming up as always you can check the app out and see what's going on there all right let's get in the bible here go along with what our sweet time of worship psalms 47 open up there I just want to read Psalm 47. We're not going to spend a lot of time in it. Talking about worship. It says, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of joy. Why shout to God? Why praise God? Verse 2, For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under, under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us. The glory of Jacob, whom he loves. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The prince of the people have assembled themselves as the people of God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Father God, as we come before you at this time, Lord, this evening, Lord, as we purpose ourselves to the, the reading and the hearing of your word, the purpose of, of gathering together as a, a church, Lord, a, a gospel community, Lord, would you speak to us? God, we do pray that you get the praise, that you get the glory. Lord, as we recognize, as we, as we humble ourselves, before you, our King, we pray that you are highly exalted. Use this time, Lord. I pray for those who are watching at home, Lord, that they are able to be encouraged, even in their homes, Lord, that they would feel that they are a part, Lord, that your spirit would fill their home. Lord, we do pray for our kids up the hill. Lord, as we think about this, this verse here, that, that you chose our inheritance for us, that you have purposes and plans for our lives. Lord God, we know that you have purposes and plans for the lives of our kids. Lord, we commit them to you. We ask for your help. We ask for your provision. We ask for your blessing. Lord God, would you, would our kids just choose to follow you? kids on the hall, our kids up the hill, our kids that maybe that don't want to be a part of this. Lord, they would yield their lives to you. Bless us now, I pray. Speak to us through your word as, as we have even times of a little bit of open sharing. Lord, speak through that time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for he is king. I love that. You know, verse 2, he's the Lord most high. Verse 3, he subdues the people under the nations. It, you know, he's sovereign. Verse 4, he chooses our inheritance for us. This idea he has purposes and plans for our lives. Verse 7, he is the king of all the earth. Verse 8, he reigns over all the nations. And the end of verse 9, he is highly exalted. Chapter 48, verse 1, great is the Lord 
for he is greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. You know, whenever we see these type of terms in the Bible, when we're reading, when we see the term, the city of our God, or his holy city, or his holy mountain, or Mount Zion, or the city of the great king, what city are we talking about here on this earth? Jerusalem. Yeah, you get this beautiful and elevation. You go up to Jerusalem. If you remember last time in our psalm, it was a couple weeks ago. By the way, wasn't it great to hear from Pastor Leo? What a testimony. Man, if you have opportunity, I, I highly encourage you, if you didn't catch his testimony, to go back last week and, and you can catch it on uh, our YouTube channel. And you can see that. It's awesome. But if you remember, we were in Psalm 46. You want to look back there. And we read this line in here. It's a prophetic line. And I said we'd pick up here this next time we got in our Psalms. But in Psalm 46... There was this prophetic word about this new Jerusalem. In verse 4, it says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. If you're with us on the virtual tour of Israel, we learn that there is no river running through Jerusalem. What water source is there in Jerusalem? Who is with us? Come on. This is the test. The spring of... Oh, come on. Somebody besides Kelly. <laughs> Gihon, yeah. Gihon. G-G-I-H-O-N. Gihon. It's, the only one. it's a spring. It's, there's not a river that runs through. But the Bible tells us that this present earth it's going to fade away. It's going to pass away, and there's going to be this new heavens and this new earth, and there's going to be this new Jerusalem. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of Bible reading with me, and I want you to turn. I don't have this one through the overhead. So put a marker there in Psalms. Go over to the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 3. So towards the end of your New Testament, find 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to look at some passages here. I want to look at Revelation. And I want to consider and to think about this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord, and we did lots of talk on that when we did our study in Thessalonians, talking about this. There's this idea of the day of the Lord encompasses the second coming of Christ. It encompasses the, the great tribulation time. Um, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burnt up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning. The elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, verse 13, we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay, turn a little bit over to Revelation chapter 3. A few pages to your right. Revelation 3, 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Okay, look at Revelation 21. So this is 
if we're putting this on a uh, on a eschatology timeline, the study of end times timeline, what we're talking about here is after the great seven year great tribulation period, after the thousand year millennial reign, then comes this new heaven, new earth, chapter 21, verse 21, verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there's no longer any sea, and I saw the whole city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Skip down to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. And there's a great description here of the new Jerusalem. I want to get to verse 22. Look at verse 22. And I saw no temple in it, this new Jerusalem, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it in the daytime, for there will be no night. Its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We know according to the scriptures that your name is written in this Lamb's book of life when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Chapter 22 here. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God, which we already learned that this is in the new Jerusalem, and of the Lamb, and in the middle of the streets on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads, that there will be no longer any night, and they will not need of, of the light of the lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. Psalm 46. We read there, Psalm 46, verse 4, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her and she will not be moved, and God will help her when the morning dawns. You see there's this idea that there is this gladness in the dwelling place of the Most High because it is God's presence that illuminates our life. This is what the Bible is telling us that it's God's presence in our lives that illuminates our life, our life. And you think about, without the presence of God, there is darkness, there is confusion, there is uncertainty. And what do we see in this world today? I mean, it's hard enough for those who have faith, but you look at those who don't have faith, who don't have the presence of God in their life, they don't have that illumination in their life, they, they are full of uncertainty. They are full of confusion, full of anxiety. Now, Psalm 48. This is what they're declaring here. It's a declaration. 
Great is the Lord, greatly is to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, this new Jerusalem. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, in the great of the, uh, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. And so there's different ways we can look at this here. And, and I'm, I'm pointing to you right now to um, probably an allegory is the best word. Looking at this in a spiritual sense of God's present and presence in our lives, bringing illumination, bringing, you know, God is our stronghold. But there's also a physical sense. You know, when we talk about Jerusalem in the Old Testament, we're talking about this presence of God. You know, the temple there in Jerusalem represented this presence of God. And we understand through the New Testament scriptures that we become now the temple of God and that God's very presence now is in us. And so we become this dwelling place of God where his presence is in us. It's illuminating our lives. It's giving us direction. And we can take comfort in that, knowing that God is with us and greater is he who is in us than who is in the world. And if God is for us, then who can be against us? These are the promises that we have in the word. And so when we're looking at these things, these are the truths. Now, for the writer of the day of the Psalms here, that it says in our title, you know, the beauty and the glory of Zion, talking about Jerusalem, it says a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. The thought is that this psalm was written from an experience that Israel had. This is what we've seen, repeated theme, right? We read a psalm, and we're like, where did the psalm come from? What was the inspiration behind the psalm? And often it points to this experience that the, either the, the psalmist had, maybe it was David that had a personal experience, or maybe the nation had. And for us here, the thought is that come, it came out of Second Chronicles when uh, the land of Judah was been invaded by the enemy, and the enemy was coming up against Jerusalem, this holy city, this Mount Zion, this special place, and they were going to be invaded. They were outnumbered, and God stepped in. I want you to see this. So hold your finger there. Go to the left, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Chronicles is in the category of history. So when we're reading Kings, Chronicles, uh, that type of book, it's giving us history of the nation Israel. And so what we're going to read about is an experience that Israel had, and we're going to see that this psalm came out of this experience. It's a response of God's provision and deliverance. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're reading about the land of Israel being invaded, the land of Judah. Judah is in the is the territory where Jerusalem resided. It says here, chapter 20, verse 1, it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon together with some of the Midianites came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is a king of Israel. Then some came and reported Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea out of Aram and behold, they're in Hezron, Timar, that is in Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid. Okay, you've just been told this formidable enemy, enemy is coming against you. They're going to attack you. They're going to plunder you. They're going to take your goods. And what does he do? He turned, verse 3, his attention to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah, you know, region in Israel, gathered together to seek help from the Lord, and they even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Super practical, and I'm sure you've done this. Something out of your control, something maybe threatening, something that you don't know what to do about has come upon you, and you're like, Lord, <laughs> I need help. Maybe you grab your family members and say, we need to pray. Maybe you call a couple trusted friends. Will you pray? You call your life group. Will you pray with us? I remember we even, as elders, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were some things that we just were trying to make a decision on. Like, let's fast and 
about this. So we fasted and prayed to seek the Lord about what to do, what, what decision to make. This is what they did. And God answered them. They got the whole group together. They're fasting. They're praying. Uh, skip down to verse 14. Remember in the Old Testament, the God would speak through these prophets. And so the prophet is sent to speak a word to the nation Israel. Chapter 20, verse 14. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, uh, son of this guy and son of that guy and son of this guy and blah, 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 blah. And he said, verse 15, listen, all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord. So right there, when, the, when, the, when a prophet in the Old Testament come and says, listen, thus says the Lord, you listen. What does he say? Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. And I just want you to, I'm almost like weeping when I read that. I feel like so often we take on these battles. They're not ours. This is God's battle to fight, not ours. Battle's not yours. This is God's. Tomorrow, verse 16, go down against them. Behold, they will come up from the ascent of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the valley in front of you of the wilderness of Jeruel. Verse 17, you need not to fight this battle. Station yourselves, stand and see, and the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah of Israel. God's like, this is your battle. But here, come here, I want you to watch this. Come, stand right here, check this out. Get a good seat, front row, watch this. Watch what I'm going to do. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. All Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fell down before the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. The Levites, here it is, from the sons of the Kohathites. Here's our sons of Korah from the Psalms who write the Psalms. And the sons of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. And then they wrote a couple Psalms. <laughs> they rose early in the morning, verse 20. They went out to the wilderness of Tekeo and they went down, uh, went out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, O Jew, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, put your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. We, we could say, you know, what we have today. Put your trust in God's word and you'll have success. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. So here they are. They're marching out with their army, just praising God. And then they began singing and praising, and the Lord set an ambush against the sons of Ammon, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. So they were routed for the sons of Ammon, and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. So God caused a little confusion there, and he had these armies that were going to come and all attack. They ended up attacking each other, and the armies that were going to come take out Israel, take out Jerusalem, they killed each other, destroying them. Here, look at the verse 23, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And when Judah came to look out of the wilderness, they looked towards the multitude and behold, they were corpse lying on the ground and no one had escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, valuable things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because they had, there was so much. The battle's not yours, it's God's. You need not fight this battle. I think about, you know, sometimes there's 
medical stuff that happens. You know, people get, they, they go through cancer. And at that point, they have to trust God. And, and it becomes this God's battle. There's things that come upon our lives that are just out of our control. What are we going to do about it? There's nothing that we can do. And at that point, it's, it's not our battle. It's God's battle. Anybody have a testimony of this in your own life that you want to share? Yeah. Psalm 48. There's this response. If, if this was written in response to this deliverance, you know, he's spoken the first three verses about this Jerusalem being a stronghold, this place of God being the stronghold. And said in verse 4, For lo, the kings assembled themselves. You know, we had these different armies that assembled against Israel. They passed by together. They saw it, and then they were amazed, and they were terrified, and they fled in alarm. Panic seized them. Their anguish as if the, a woman in childbirth. With the east winds, you break up the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God God will establish her forever. We have thought, verse 9, on your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. As is your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go around her. Count her towers. Consider her ramparts. Go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. For such is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us until death. They're responding in amazement. I, I think this is such a natural thing for us to, to practice. If we experience God's provision and God's you know, deliverance, let's praise him. Let's let it known to the next generation. Tell of the deliverance. Keep your testimony alive. You know, I kind of feel like my testimony's got a little crusty and I need to get it out and I need to work it a little bit. I don't remember the last time I told it. You know, am I above or, you know, over my testimony? No. It's still relevant. It should still be causing passion and causing me to draw closer to God and pursuing Him. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Amen. Amen. Yeah. And we can give him testimonies in today. Yeah. Yeah, even the little stuff. I mean, it doesn't have to be this big, huge thing. It could be the little things, you know, noticing God's thing. And I just think that this word, you know, it's not your battle. It's his battle. In so many ways, that is such a relevant word. And, and how often I wonder, does God want us just to step aside and watch what he's going to do? And we're like, now nah, we got this, God. We'll take care of it, you know. That's me. And he, he's like, well, oh, just be patient here a second. Just watch me do it. That's humbling. You're vulnerable. You're walking by faith. That's a good word. Switching gears a little bit here in Psalm 49. I think it's a good psalm for us to, to think about here, and there's much to consider. I think it's relevant in our, our world today, especially as um, citizens of this, this great country we live in. We, we live in a country of wealth. We have lots of wealth. And our society seems to be really driven by wealth. And honestly, probably most decisions you make are surrounded by a financial decision. And it may not be your fault. It may just be the culture we live in and, and how it's preceded. But the psalm deals with wealth and riches. And really, you see it right in the title, the folly of trusting in 
riches. I've also I've thought about another title for this. What if we said, what money can't buy? Right, this old saying that you know, money can buy happiness, right? Or money can't buy happiness. My son got me this um, sign for my garage. And it says, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy a Jeep, and that's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> verse, chapter 49, verse 1, Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth will speak wisdom. You tell him here, hey, listen. I'm going to speak some wisdom here. And the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on the harp. Why should I fear in days of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surround me? Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches, no man can by any means redeem his brother. Or give to God a ransom for himself, for the redemption of his soul is costly. And he should cease trying forever, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay, for he sees that even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless alike perish, and they leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own names. But man in his pomp will not endure. He's like the beasts that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their words. As sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and their form shall be for Sheol to consume, so that they have no habitation. But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Do not be afraid, verse 16, when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him, Though while he lives, he congratulates himself. And though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beast that perish. So let me ask you, what can't money buy? Salvation. What else? Come on, let's talk about this. Eternal life. Love, grace. Money can't buy love? Isn't there a song about that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> True friends. I had that experience. There was a time in my life where I had access to marijuana, lots of it, and I had lots of friends. But when that went away, guess what else went away? Those friends. What else? Huh? Peace. But isn't that the temptation that money will give you peace? <laughs> money buys more worries, not peace. Um, where? Did I have a verse for you. Oh, that's in Ecclesiastes. Let's, okay, so the psalmist says, you guys are on it. According to the psalmist here, verse, verse 7 and 8, he says that money can't buy your salvation, right? Uh, there's a couple different ways you can translate this. It says, verse 7, no man can by any means redeem his brother. Does anybody else have a different word for brother in their translation? Another? It can be translated another, it can be translated himself. Um, and it says, or give to God a ransom for him or himself. Like somehow you could buy someone's salvation. First Peter, I have this for the overhead. Here we go. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 17. You guys got that up there? Yeah. 
He says, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, it says, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, money, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of the lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And so clearly spoken by Peter is that you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and Jesus' appearance on this earth was for that very purpose, and it was done with an eternal purpose. And so he says in our psalm, Psalm 49, verse 8, the redemption of his soul is costly. Verse 9, that he should live on eternally. We're redeemed with eternal purposes. We should live with eternal purposes. And, and if you're getting anything out of this psalm, which is kind of reads like a proverb, is, is he's encouraging, he's exhorting, saying this riches and monies should be stewarded with an eternal purpose. Because if we steward our riches and our monies, our wealth here on this earth for temporal earthly purposes, it, it doesn't do anything. You end up giving it to other people and you end up dying and not taking anything with you and you get, you know, other people use it and you don't get to enjoy it. And he's saying use it with eternal purposes. What do he say here? Verse 10, he says, we see that even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless are the same. And the inner thought is that their houses are going to go on forever, that you could interpret their dwelling places to all generations. You could interpret that, that they're going to have this inheritance to leave to the next generation. And none of that is evil or wrong. But this thought that somehow that they could have this possession forever. Now, when you think of a house in the context of something monetarily, what do you think of? What does it represent? Comfort. Comfort? Yep. What else? Security. Stability, security, investment. Right? It's a big deal these days. Maybe it's just a big deal to me because I sold mine. I don't have one. So <laughs> kind of a big deal right now to me. <laughs> And I'm not homeless, by the way. We have an apartment that we're living in, and we're fine. <laughs> Verse 12, he says, The man in his pomp will not endure. He ends up being like the beasts that perish. The, this is the way, verse 13, this is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve of their words. The way of foolish is the one who focuses on earthly riches for a sense of eternal security. Like you, your, your earthly riches aren't going to give you an eternal security. They're not evil. Earthly riches are not evil. Kelly talked beautifully on this on Sunday. Um, dovetails into this message very well. How you view them, how you use them, and where you're actually finding your true sense of peace and security is what is important. The statement here I think is interesting. Verse 18, he says, though while he lives, he congratulates himself. You know, you do well in the stock market. Oh, good job, you know. You amass a bunch of money or you have some great success and the men praise you. Hey, you did well for yourself. And he says, you're going to die. You're going to go to, <laughs> just like everybody else. And if you're using temporal riches, earthly riches, with, with this temporal mindset, he's saying you're like this, the beast, verse 20, that perish. And so there's a, there's a statement here. The use of wealth without eternal understanding is to live like an animal. The use of wealth without eternal understanding is like an animal. 
Ecclesiastes talks about, oh, we are going to go one more. Okay, we're not done yet. Hold the phone here. We're almost there, guys. I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes. To the right, a little bit. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Check this out. This is great. We're almost done. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. The love of money. There's, here's some great wisdom. Chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. Here's, Don, this is kind of like what you were just saying. This is great. Verse 11. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. <laughs> it's like there's never enough, right? So what is the advantage to the owners except to look on? The, the, the sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats a little or much, but his, his full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is a grievous evil, verse 13, which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. See, that would be a temporal mindset versus the eternal mindset. An eternal mindset with, with riches and with wealth would be to be generous and to be sharing. The, the temporal or the earthly mindset would be uh, selfish and hoarding. He says, when those riches were lost, verse 14, through a bad investment, and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor, and he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil, exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind throughout his life? He also eats in the darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Here is what I've seen. So Solomon here is one of the richest guys. He's, he's talking about this. To be good and to fitting, to eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. I just see this comparison of someone who's hoarding and selfish versus someone who is generous and sharing. The person who's generous and sharing, they're enjoying life. The person who's hoarding and is selfish, they're vexation and it's not fun and they're it's not good hopefully that helps you guys you know like I said Kelly taught it of this first Timothy chapter 6 uh, on Sunday and it talked about this idea the temptation of falling in love with money and this love of money is becomes this root of all evil and it's caused some to to plunder themselves into many griefs and he wrote a life group question, if you didn't, you're not in a life group or you haven't discussed this yet. And I want to ask you guys and see what the chatter is. Why is money or the lack of money so powerful that we're tempted to love it? What is that about money that we're tempted to love? Have we already said it enough? Have we, have we beaten this horse? It's about status. status, okay. We've, we've talked about security. Yeah, and if you think about your own testimonies, I mean, you know, you have different seasons and different times in life, and I remember when Shawnee and I didn't have much, and the joy that we had and the, and the fun that we had in that time, but I remember thinking, boy, if we made 100 bucks more, or if we had, you know, a little bit more money, we could then do that, but yeah, we're, we're fine. And, and then you make the more money, and guess what happens? You spend it. Yeah, and I think that's what Kelly hit on on Sunday. <clears throat> I thought was great. It was like, having money and wealth, that's not evil. That's not wrong. Be generous with it. What you do with it, your mindset with it, is what is, can be the, the, the wrong. Money provides opportunity. So that would be the temptation to love it because it provides the opportunity. So, again, let's proceed with an eternal mindset versus a temporal mindset with opportunity. 
Boy, so much we could talk about. It's a good topic. Okay, Isaac, one more. Go ahead. That's good. And it was like what Paul said, you know, he learned to get along with much and with little. And it was through God's presence in his life. Well, Lord, we thank you for this great opportunity. God, I pray that as these things obviously are sparking um, uh, conversation and uh, maybe conviction, maybe inspiration, Lord, I pray that as we consider your eternal purposes and your eternal word, God, we would have an eternal mindset as we steward our time and our talent and our treasure here, Lord, that are all from you. Lord, I give you praise, Lord, that you have redeemed us, Lord. First and foremost, Lord, that we are redeemed, we are saved by your grace, and that we can even have blessings, Lord, in our lives. So help us to see the blessings that you do have for us, whether they're little or lot or however they're measured, God, we, we know that you provide for us. And Lord, these battles, Lord, that, that aren't ours to fight, God, help us to see that and to yield to you and to trust that you will fight these battles, Lord. We give you the praise, give you the glory for tonight, and we ask for your blessing, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.